This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you again by the Magic at the Beach, which will be held from October 5th, 6th, and 7th, and will take place in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. For more information, you can go to magicatthebeach.org. We'll have more information from Charles Bach midway into this episode, so stay tuned for that. And thank you guys very much for sponsoring this program. And for that matter, I thank the newest members who are friends of the Magic Word, who during the TAOM while I was gone happened to pledge or donate. So I want to thank and welcome our newest friends of the Magic Word, Ben Goh, Matthew Jacobson, and Sanjay Subramanyam. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate you becoming friends of the Magic Word and helping us with your financial support, some with donations, some with pledges. And each and every dollar that comes in certainly helps to defray our many expenses that we have associated with producing this particular program. Each week, I like to bring you some different and interesting content. And the guest that I'm going to be talking with today is someone that I have been wanting to sit down with for a very, very long time. But due to his schedule and mine, we have not been able to actually do that. And I really wanted to do it in person rather than trying to do it over Zoom or recording it some other way. And we have seen each other at some conventions, but we have both had some obligations that took us into different directions. And so we weren't able to sit down until this year when we were at Houston at the Texas Association of Magicians. Now, I have some other podcast episodes that I want to bring you in future weeks that I had recorded prior to this, but I thought due to the current nature of the topic that we're discussing here, that it's important that I bring this to you now rather than waiting for a few weeks or months before rolling this out. Specifically, my guest here is Steve Valentine, who not only is a magician, but his primary profession is as an actor. And right now in the United States, we're going through an actor's and writer's strike. And as such, he is involved with that. And so he is waiting for this strike to be complete, which gave him an opportunity to then be at the convention and for us to have a chance to chat. A lot of what we talk about to begin with here has to do with the strike that's currently going on and also about what it is specifically that they are trying to get. It's not necessarily more money, but the issue has to do with streaming services as well as AI, both of which are very much in the news today. And I thought uh, would not only it was not only of interest to me, I was fascinated by it, but I think that you'll be enthralled also. Anyhow, he has a lot to say about that. And then, of course, we talk about his one man show and uh, magic. Uh, career and and other kinds of things, as well as the acting that he has done on several movies and on television shows then as well. And he's got some very delightful stories that will uh, keep you coming back and wanting to listen to this episode that again, great stuff. So please, I welcome my guests here this week, Mr. Steve Valentine here on The Magic Word. go. Okay. Today I've got with me a guest who is a man who is a star of not only magic, but stage and screen. Uh, many of you may have seen him, have heard of him. Perhaps you own uh, one of his uh, many DVDs. You're familiar with his magic on the go, perhaps. We'll be talking about that. As I said, uh, star of stage and screen, which he's been on uh, several movies, uh, one of which was The Walk, by, uh, directed by uh, Robert Zemeckis, who you remember from did Back to the Future, uh, as well as many others, as well as Crossing Jordan and uh, many other television shows. And he gets has some wonderful bit parts and things. It seems like I remember in Modern Family, he was like a yoga teacher or something. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, different kinds of things. And he is uh, also uh, not only does a lot of movie magic, but just he does a lot of magic because he lives in the Los Angeles area where the movie magic happens. And he is also a regular performer over at the Magic Castle. And from time to time, he does do magic. Magic convention, so you might see him out on the magic convention circuit from time to time and place to place. And uh, he uh, resides, as I said, in Los Angeles, and I'm assuming not a local uh, native of Los Angeles because of his accent that he is from uh, <laughs> from over the, across the pond and has been here then for a long number of years. And someone also might be familiar with his cards across. It's it's awesome. So anyhow, uh, enough for me. Let's hear from my guest. Here he is this week, uh, my friend, and soon to be yours, uh, if he's not already, Steve Valentine. Hey, Steve. Hello, hello. 
Everyone, sit down, everybody. Sit down. No, it's fine. I'm human. I am just like you. Sit, please. It's all right. Get off the floor, sir. Get off the floor. You're like a Rex to this. You put your pants on one leg at a time. That's right. Sometimes, yeah, in the, yeah, I jump up and I do the poof thing and then I, I put it backwards because I'm scared of the zip. So. <laughs> and then you switch that your legs after you're already in the yes. pants. Okay. You are a magician, sir. Yes, you are. I am. <laughs> um, I had, um, uh, I mentioned about uh, working with uh, uh, different films and yeah. uh, and that right now as we're talking we're going through a writer strike and so this yeah. affects you uh, dramatically and, and, and actors yeah we're all on strike yes and so it was the writers first and then the actors then joined in on the strike or how exactly did that uh, work no, we have our own strike thank you is our own personal okay. strike yeah okay. but no we're at we're so they could settle with the, the, the we're kind of team we're kind of supporting each other right now gotcha. um, it's. Uh, the directors made a deal, so it would have been great if they hadn't, because then we could have all stuck together, because directors, actors, and writers together would have been a very powerful triumvirate. Right? But but the two of us are pretty great. So so we're... Uh, and, and I think what's really interesting about this writer's strike, it's very important writer's strike right now. It's about a lot of different things. And, you know, the... Um, streaming, not the least of it. Not just streaming, but it's, yeah, it's, it's streaming, it's AI, it's they, the... The, hmm. the, um, the producers uh, have, have systematically cut down the profit participation and the ability for an actor to make a living. You can be, you can be in a television series now and not have enough money to last a year, which is insane. It used to be what? way better. Yeah, wow. it's, it's great. There was a, uh, an actress who was on, who was on one of these H, top HBO shows called Euphoria, and she was actually just quoting that she needs another job because she doesn't make enough on that show. Mm -hmm. So, in, so what's, what's happened in the last 10 years is they've systematically cut down, cut down, cut down to the point where the corporations are still making the billions, but it, the, the wealth is not being spread. And um, hmm. so what, what's kind of interesting about the situation is Almost everybody who's in the industry has a side hustle, a side gig, something else that they use to make money because they've had to. We've, we've all had to adjust to the new... And not uh, just waitressing or waiting no, at no, tables. I mean, no, other, other businesses, other careers, you know. I'm lucky. I have the magic. Sure. The magic is a great, uh, it's a great outlet for me. And, and it's something I love to do. And, uh, but so, whereas the, I think the producers are in a situation right now where they think they can squeeze us to the point where you know we're not going to we're going to have to give in because we don't have any money right we're all so used to having side hustles we're going to this strike's going to go on for a while because you know we are i didn't know that the directors actually had settled because i always thought if the directors go on strike that would be the thing that would really force them to the bargaining table because they're the ones who have the big money. I think know? the studios believe that they can do it without the writers because they've got AI. They think they can do it without the actors because they've got AI. But you still need someone to kind of direct everything. Um, so, yeah, that was a little disappointing. But uh, but I still think it's, it's pretty powerful. WGA, uh, you know, uh, uh, SAG made this interim deal as well where you, as an actor, you can do a film if it's uh, independently produced, if it's not produced by anyone, um, anyone who's part of the... Uh, the AMPT. Uh, so essentially, uh, if I wanted to produce a movie, I could still get SAG actors in it, you know, if I did it on my own. On your own. Independent oh, okay. financing. Um, what about but, writers? Uh, yeah, well, this is the thing. Um, we thought that was going to be great with WGA, but WGA is very smart. They said, nope, not even that. No one gets a WGA writer until this strike is over. And what does that stand for? What WGA is? Writers Guild of America. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting. We'll see what happens, but it's probably the most important strike that we've ever had for the future of the industry. I was about to ask you about that because, as I recall, wasn't it in the '80s or something? I think that there was a a strike. There was another one, and and it was that was important. That went for a while, and that's and from no, there was one in the '90s, and where from that came reality television because they had to fill. Oh, that's right. They had right. to uh, create content, so reality television was kind of created as a as a way of keeping the, their lights on right um and then it was a way of doing it on the cheap because they really didn't have to pay and it was actors. and it's non-union and so right. yeah yeah and that was that was tough i think that uh i think we have to move forward with technology but uh you know just because you can doesn't mean you should 
And when you you're saying think, AI, you're talking about where they can actually replace an actor. They can have like your image and maybe even your voice and they could do it without Justine you. Justine know, Bateman has been doing a lot of posts on uh, what is in the pipeline with AI as far as film and television goes okay. because she's, that's part of something she's really involved in. And basically you can take uh, The Godfather okay. and I can say, uh, um, hey, Scott, you want to play, play the Brando role? And I can put your face in that film. Oh, man. And suddenly it becomes, you know, is that you, you won't get any, the actor doesn't get any money because his performance is being used. They want to own your performance, own your voice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want to offer an actor, hey, we will give you a certain amount of money for your image. And then we can put that into anything we want. Um, and so now they're sneaking those clauses into the contracts. A lot of extras have been giving up their image rights. So they'll get one session fee. Just so that way, I mean, they're trying to get their foot in the door, and that's the way of doing well, it. Well, they'll they'll look so they can use that person's face as an extra uh -huh. in, from that in perpetuity. Wow! Uh, but they don't get any extra money for it. So, so you not know it, what you're giving up when you're signing the oh contract. Oh my gosh! You got to be and and even in like right now in technology, for example, Zoom updated their their uh, terms and conditions, and if you look at it, they basically are saying that anything that you do and create in Zoom can be used to train and for AI. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So if you think you're having a private conversation in Zoom, you're not. I don't think you are. Yeah, I think it. And, and that's I did kind not of, know that. Yeah, a lot of people are refusing to use Zoom now because of that. Huh. And so the the um, the AI thing is is uh, is interesting. Ironically, to me, you know, the the big these giant corporations are also trying to copyright their AI works, mm -hmm. even though they don't want to give copyright or protection or or appreciate the individual creative rights of the people who are creating the stuff that ends up being used by AI to create <laughs> their own, you know, yes, wow. you can't have copyright protection, but we can, you know, and that just got thrown out of, I think, one court in Europe. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of BS going on. And, wow. and, and the reality is there's more than enough money to go around. And it's just, it really comes down to greed, I think. And the corporations you're saying are not willing to share that. Uh, they're, no, they're absolutely not willing to share that. No. Huh. Yeah. Uh, and it's, a, and it's a shame, you know. They, I, I, you don't think it's going to be the death of certain things? You, just, you think it's going to create something else? I think everything else? will morph and change, yeah. Right. Just yeah. like we were talking about reality shows. I mean, that kind of came as a result of that. What are you predicting could come as a result of this if we don't settle Oof. by this time next year? I, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 there's, there's always surprises. Um, I think the one thing that the executives seem to forget is that it, it, we are a personality-run industry. Mm-hmm. And whilst, yes, you could get AI to play roles in films, uh, those AI are not going to be your premieres. They're not going to mix with the fans. They're mm -hmm. not going to sign autographs. Good point. The people, the public are not going to follow your AI character uh, and want to meet them or fall in love with them. Or, you know, you're going to lose that personal touch. And you, you just look at the, how popular autograph signing shows are these days. Right. And, and how many people show up at a movie premiere. Like, who's going to do that for an AI? Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I don't want to sound like the guy that said, you know, television is just a fad. Yeah. <laughs> you know? This internet thing. Color also, television yes. is like, nah, <laughs> black and white's fine. Um, so, but that's why I don't think there's any absolutes. That technology is just so crazy that who knows? I mean, AI, we're almost at the point of singularity and that's going to change everything too. You know? I can kind of see that, but I disagree a little bit as far as there not, may not be people who are interested like in autographs or whatever. I'm just thinking like at Comic-Con or uh, at, uh, you know, these gaming things. I yep. have always been amazed uh, about this. It's not really an underworld. There's a world out there of gamers who yep. uh, perform like Super Bowl kind of events with uh, these games and big televisions and sure. thousands, tens of thousands of people come and watch. Watch them. Watch the them game. perform. So yep. that's not AI, but they're watching something and they want to get the autographs of those people. A, I you know? mean, you sort of have human beings involved. And oh, I, I think see what the, you're saying. I think the idea, the, the ultimate studio dream is to be able to create content without anybody. <laughs> so you can't get you know? a, you cannot get a, uh, an autograph from the real Batman in a comic book because it's just a drawn, that's what you're drawing. A well, more than the person who's doing the content. So uh, if I, I did a ton of video games, Uncharted and Dragon Age, and with you your know, voice? You with mean? my voice okay. and, and motion capture. Hmm. And then you, I can, even though people are fans of the video game, and that's not a real character, you know, they're still going to, not a real person, mm -hmm. uh, they're still going to, I still have people all the time ask me to sign autographs or do or stuff on Cameo. Sign their game thing or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Cameo is really popular, you know. 
uh, where you can just do a shout out to somebody as the character or whatever. Oh, yeah. So I, I, think, I think you miss that personal touch. And I hope that that is something that they'll realize when you try to push people out. Um, that you lose that. That you lose that. Mm -hmm. But who knows? I mean, I, wow. I'm shocked at the way it's going already. So Now, when you say going already, I mean from the standpoint that it hasn't been settled or they haven't even come to the table yet? Just about what's, what we're actually able to do right now oh, oh, with, I see what with you're the saying. technology yes. and the AI. It's, it's yeah. stuff I couldn't have predicted a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think live will always be king. Mm -hmm. I think that it's good for live entertainment because I think that'll be one of the few genuinely um, real experiences that people can have. You're talking about movies, but this or, or, or television, or both. Uh, when I talk about live, I mean live entertainment. I think it's. I think that what's going on. You in mean like Elton John kind of yeah, concert just like any and... kind of live performance. I think it's great. Okay. You know, there was a time when people were so behind their screens that uh, uh, they, they weren't going out. But I think if you want an authentic experience now, you're going to go out. And you're going to see something live. Tech has had this habit. I've, I've noticed that in tech. Um, there's been so much that's helped us over the years, but it's also destroyed a number of businesses in the, in the process, uh, music being one of them, right? The, the musicians, it's oh, yeah. hard for them to make money. There's a great video online of Snoop Dogg having a conversation with- Yep, uh, seen it. You're right? Yeah. So he's literally like, just explain to me, I don't understand, you know? How can I have a billion views and not make a million dollars? Like he doesn't, <laughs> and that's what I mean. It's like they yeah. fooled us in, in two things, one being, they fool this into thinking, okay, give it up for free because you can make money on your side job. On the side job, which mm. is for artists, the only way they make money is live touring now and merchandise because they're not making it off the actual product, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the tech company is doing that. Uh, and, uh, and they've also fooled us into thinking that we now, and I don't know if anyone else realizes this, there was a time when we were paid to create content. Now we create content in the hope that they will pay us. So you submit create, scripts and you, hope somebody will buy well, it. You, you do video, you put it online, oh, you create, um, you know, you go onto YouTube, go onto Instagram. They've got, every, these corporations are brilliant because they've got the world creating content for, for them, them for free. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll make money off advertising, um, which is something that they get paid for as well. So the corporations are not, they're running the business, but imagine having a staff of, five million creatives mm -hmm. putting together videos, putting together uh, sketches, putting together all these sure. bits of business, all these bits of business, and you're not having to pay them at all. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they'll get a percentage of the advertising if it works. You know what this reminds me of? I spoke to you earlier mentioning that my major in undergrad school was uh, in advertising. And I remember yeah. uh, studying um, uh, this one in which uh, there was an agency that was saying, okay, well, we're consider. I'm sorry, there was a company that was considering leaving this ad agency. And so the other ad agencies around New York said, okay, well, we'll pitch them with these ideas. Right. Let's say it was Pan Am, for an example. So they come to them with, okay, here are some TV spots. Here are some ad spots we'll put in Playboy magazine or wherever, you know, just kind of around. So they created a campaign and different companies were pitching Pan Am, trying right. to get their business away from that. What I think their underlying motivation was to get new ideas because the ad agency had kind of run out of ideas. And they weren't sure. And they said, oh, I like this. And right. they just because they, you know, gave them free ideas and they stuck with their original agency, but used someone else's idea. And they kind of you that's know. a sneaky way of doing it. Yeah, uh, I think that. But I think in, in the same way, uh, everyone is working at that ad agency is making money. Mm -hmm. So you know, and, and everyone's on a salary. So even if they didn't get to sell the idea, the company would take the hit. Yeah. But uh, the employees, the Still people got paid, got paid right? Mm -hmm. and so, but what oh, we I do now is we there. create content yeah. and we go pitch it essentially to the public or whatever. And if it doesn't hit, we don't make money. So, you know, I talk to, to a lot of guys who are fairly well-known um, content creators online, you know, their YouTube success or whatever. But for every one video that, they, that, that hits, they're creating 10, 15, 20 that don't. Sure. And for free. And so the pressure is, is on. At, at the same time, my God, we have an open market. If you're good and you're, you're resilient and you're creative and, and you really put your, your, yourself into your work, you can make a lot of money. So mm -hmm. the gatekeeper, there are no gatekeepers in that respect. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's pros and cons, obviously. Well, that was, I was mentioning my, my, my writer buddy, uh, Tom Blomquist, who had <clears throat> done the A team and Walker Texas Ranger and yeah. Swamp Thing, a bunch of Hallmark, et cetera. So he was saying when he was working, uh, and there was another writer with him, and they were submitting ideas. I mean, they, um, 
didn't get everything sold to them, uh, the studio necessarily. Right. But this other guy, he felt was a better writer than him and had more creative ideas. But after a while of getting uh, denials, he finally got out of the business. And he said, I wish he would have stuck around because he was a good writer. He just got discouraged too soon. Yeah. And that's the thing, it seems like, that if you want to get your idea put forward, you can't stop. I mean, if this is your passion, then you need to continue to work at Absolutely. it despite whatever falls you have as you know? an actor um you got to be pitching all the time I mean, you're auditioning i'm assuming all the time auditions are pitches right i'm pitching yeah. myself there for a go. role and yeah. uh the same goes for when i when i first got to town i realized that um in order to be successful as an actor you needed to give yourself the longevity the time to to some people break in straight away and for some it's a slow burn you know mm -hmm. you you don't know the speed you, don't, you have no control over the speed of your of your career how you but mm. you, if you don't give it the time you're never going to know. So I always, I always, when I ever meet an actor in LA who says, I'm going to give it a year, you know, maybe they're like, they're the top, um, they're the top actor in their university class. So they mm -hmm. think they're, you know, sure. or, or they're the best looking actress, right. you know, and you realize you get to LA and you realize there's a million people better looking. There's a million people better acting than you. There's just like uh, college football and you finally get in the NFL and you realize these guys are yeah, a lot bigger. These than guys me. are good. Yeah. <laughs> really these good. are good. These guys are really, <laughs> the you big know, leagues. so suddenly you're the, 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 um, talent pool has increased, mm -hmm. uh, you have to, and so you, you, A, you have to figure out ways of breaking, standing above the noise, mm -hmm. you know, being heard. Nowadays, I think that's the great, one of the greatest uses for social media because the studios, the casting directors, they're all looking at who's got a bigger following. So you can bring that. Oh, you mean like TikTok, YouTube, yeah, all that yeah, kind of that, stuff? All really? that. Hmm. There are actors and actress who made waves by saying that she got a role in a movie recently and she says, I know this other actress I was up against. She's way better. She's better looking. She would have killed the role, mm -hmm. but I have more followers on Instagram. Holy cow. And that's and she goes, and that's why I got it. And she's very honest about it. And 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 you can understand sometimes when an actor gets a part, say for uh, a net especially a television or cable network, where you have more followers than they have viewers. So you can see why that, that's where they want to go. Um, but I, do, I think that you have to give it time. I think that you, you need to commit your life to it, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. What was that movie that John Armstrong was in, Brian Gillis, and they were talking about... Uh, magicians. Or something. Yeah, magicians. Magicians, yeah. I think it was a documentary. Documentary, yeah. And there was a similar kind of a movie, apparently, about people who, who they followed some dancers in Broadway. That was their passion. And they would do everything, you know, as they were, in order to get... A role on yeah. Broadway, yeah. Uh, and this was just kind of like magic. And the point was, uh, I got out of that film was the passion that each of these people had to pursue their career, despite whether it meant divorce or whether that you know living in a garage or whatever. Yeah. I don't care. I, I think it depends on your motivation for 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 the job in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. I'll meet people who just want to be famous, or yeah. who want to make a lot of money, mm -hmm. and then you'll meet people who are just in love with the 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 world of acting. Mm -hmm. um, but we all know that uh, in sh film and television, especially, it's not the, always the best actor that gets the part. It's, mm -hmm, the, it's mm -hmm. the person who looks the right part. It's <laughs> That's the, right. you know, you remind the producer of an ex or you don't remind the producer of an ex. That's right. Or there's a lot of reasons why you get the role. And, and your talent is, is way down on that list. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in theater, you really have to blow people away on the stage. You know, there's no kind of like, well, he's cute. I'll put him in the front and, because that's not going to work for the whole production. Um, I met a guy who, uh, one of the first sitcoms I did was called Nikki and with uh, Nikki Cox for the WB that was around at the mm -hmm. time. And um, Nick Von Esmark uh, was the actor who played Nikki Cox's um, uh, husband. And he was got a large, uh, uh, large kind of, he was, he, he was a big guy and a little cuddly, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, and he played a wrestler. And it was, it was gr this great dynamic between she was a showgirl in Vegas and he was a wrestler. Mm. And, and it really worked. And then um, uh, he got that part. It was the first thing he ever auditioned for. Wow. And he got the part. So, so Nick's attitude towards the business was, Wow, this is easy. You just go and audition. Yeah, and, they'll, they'll take you. No big deal. It's not so hard, you know. <laughs> and then there are people who are amazing actors who just don't get the part because of, of all the, these various reasons. I remember once I was doing, I was, it was in the 90s. I'd done a couple of guest spots. I was trying to break in. Um, and I was doing these, these, this acting class. And this guy comes up to me 
and he says, uh, one of the other guys in the acting class, and he says, uh, do you, can I ask you a question? And I was like, sure. He said, do you really think you're going to be successful? Hmm. I was like, what a dick thing to yeah, have. Really? Just, really? <laughs> but so I, I, was, I, was, I just said, uh, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, he said, do you think you're going to, you know, break as an actor? And I, hmm. and I said, well, I, I, I hope so. I said, I have a quiet belief that if I keep going, something will, right, will, right. will come my way. And, um, and he said, well, he said, it's just that, he says, look at me. He said, uh, uh, he said, I'm short and fat and Jewish. He said, I can play doctors. I can play lawyers. He said, there's always going to be an archetypical. Mm -hmm. Stereotypical uh, kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, role that I can slot into. He right. says, you're tall, you're very skinny. You've got like a big forehead, this long hair. He said, you're very in, uh, different looking. He said, I don't see that there's a lot of like continual roles for someone of your type, you know? Okay. <laughs> At which point I wanted to smack wanted him to in the him, face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I said, uh, I said, well, I said, look, I said, as far as I'm concerned, I said, look at Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson couldn't get arrested and then he became his own type. Mm -hmm. I said, I think probably at some point I'll either become my own type or there, there will always be a role for me. I said, I, I, I truly believe something will come along and it will be more interesting than playing a doctor and a lawyer because mm -hmm. it'll be idiosyncratic. And we left it at that. And uh, less than a year later, I got Crossing Jordan. Hmm. And I'm playing this criminologist. And that's a regular part too. That you was mean, a regular role. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. playing this criminologist who was slightly goth, mm -hmm. so tall, skinny, long hair, mm -hmm. and it, it fit just perfect. fit the role, True. right? And um, it's like I wrote it for you. <laughs> yeah, it, it really was. And the um, uh, this guy who he he became he was a guest star one one episode. Oh, now that's funny. So I want to hear this one. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> I uh, you know. I, I remember somebody said that the greatest revenge is success. So <laughs> I, I welcomed him to the set. I walked him around. I, I was not going to be a, a, yeah, a dig about like it. Was, I was yeah. Like, yeah, I just. But he remembered you, obviously. Well, yeah, I know the guy pretty well. <laughs> and um, and uh, and then just at one point, I said, right, well, I got to run into my trailer. I'll yeah. see you in a bit. <laughs> yeah. you know, and I just <laughs> went off into my trailer. But it was it was the perfect revenge. <laughs> shall we say, uh, you know, I didn't need to rub that in. But for me, it was, it was, a, very, it was a very interesting conversation in the end because when he asked me these things, um, it's, it makes you think about why you're doing what you're doing and why you are where you are. And I just remember thinking, no, I have, I'm not like walking around going like, I'm going to be a star, you know. It was more just like, I know something will come my way. I'll just keep at it. I'll keep training. I'll meet a lot of people. Right. And at some point, something, the odds are, something good there's something good i can jump onto you know well, i've heard jason alexander talk about this a little bit as far as some character acting and that he felt like falstaff was the only thing he was going to be able to do you know shakespeare is going yeah. to be a comedy because you know as you said a short fat bald guy that's going to be like the character that he was going to be uh so i can but obviously he went on to be george costanza and you know seinfeld and became but very you know successful, what's interesting but, about him was i, I people don't remember him pretty woman he was great I forgot he was in that. Yeah, he was Richard. He was Richard Gere's best friend, who mm -hmm. like was like, "You're dating a hooker. You're going to destroy your life. What are you doing?" Like he, <laughs> he, and he was a much edgier character in that, and and he more killed multifaceted. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of mm. course, George became what he became known for. Yeah. Um, and of course, does mentalism and did one at the Magic Castle. <laughs> you know, I know, that's kind of cool. There's quite a history. You know, it'd be an interesting podcast to talk about all the actor magicians over over time. Um, uh, because uh, there's been quite a few. Uh, Larry Gray, who was it? Larry Gray, Larry Gray, who was Vernon's roommate back in the day, hmm. um, was a guy who tried to went into acting, didn't work out, went back to magic. There was um, Benson, you know, uh, um, from Benson Bowles. I mean, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. He 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 tried to be an actor at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Calvert, John Calvert, yeah, John Calvert who sure. did some acting, and then. I did talk with him. Did actually, you? Yeah, well, he stayed at my house for a week, and I did actually a little video with him talking about aging because he was approaching 100. But anyhow, so we, we talked about acting, and I mean, over the week that he was at the house, I mean, I, it was before I was doing podcasting. I wish I would have uh, chatted with him, uh, you know, at length. But he, one of the most terrifying magic shows at the castle I ever witnessed was him, and he passed 100, mm -hmm. and he was doing the full palace show. Okay. And he had a loaded rifle on stage. Mm hmm. Because he was doing blindfold, blindfold, yeah, with a click, click, and it was, and it was, he was pointing it 
at the audience as he was talking, yeah. you know, and he it's was a real loaded. Gun. I, I know. Yeah. And it was terrifying. <laughs> uh, but he I mean, gosh, what a, what a life. You were talking about uh, applying for roles. I yeah. auditioned. I think only once and didn't get the part. It was for a movie called Waltz Across Texas. And I was living in Midland, Texas, and they were looking for some locals to have some speaking part. Yeah. And I auditioned and they said later, you were fine, but we didn't like your beard. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I, I could have shaved, shaved that. Uh, yeah. They just don't look, you know, <laughs> like you said, every little thing. Who every knows? little thing. It's like uh, you'll go to an audition and someone will go. Yeah. I, actually, one of the most illuminating things, and you know, we, we know Victoria mm-hmm. uh, Burroughs is like, a great casting, casting director, director who's been integral to a number of things in my career. Um, she loves you. <laughs> I love her. She's amazing. Victoria and I, uh, I, I met her when I auditioned for Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And it got down to, for one of the parts for me and this other guy. And I didn't get it. I remember being devastated. Uh, I still am in a way. Uh, but she it, just want to found Frodo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, but she brought me back to Peter Jackson t- two or three mm-hmm. times. I mean, it, you know, and she's always been lovely. Um but when you sit in on a casting session, mm-hmm. which rarely happens now because everything's on tape, again, something else that's changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the old days, you used to walk in there, <laughs> actually walk into a room with yeah. real people and the director would be there, the writer, the casting director, you do it, they would redirect you, they would see if you could take direction um, and then you would, then the actor would leave and then they would discuss you right mm-hmm. then and there. Mm-hmm. And I sat in on a casting session and I was amazed at some of the crap I heard. Like people would come in, but was, what is amazing is as soon as the actor walks in the room, you kind of know within mm-hmm. 10 seconds mm-hmm. whether they're right for With the that part. that first impression. Doesn't matter how good their performance is. It could be the height, it could be the, the size of them, their energy. Uh, sometimes an actor will come in and they'll, they'll have so much kind of, they'll talk about what a shit day they've had and, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, I don't want that energy on set. And th- another reason why not to hire someone. Um, but quite often I would hear someone, uh, a, a producer would say something like, uh, yeah, we need a blonde, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you kind of go, well, you could dye, dye their hair. hair, you know, um, or, uh, oh, that person reminds me of, uh, someone I don't like, mm-hmm. you know, personally has nothing to do with pers- acting, nothing to do yeah. with the, anything, all of those things you have to deal with, take into account. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very illuminating being in those rooms. Wow. And were you... You're from England originally. Whereabouts? Yeah. Uh, well, I was born in Scotland. Okay. Um, I can't tell a Scottish accent no, at all. No, I was first, my parents were living in Glasgow at the time. Mm. Uh, and um, But then my, all my family's from Portsmouth. And um, and then we moved, when I was about three, we moved uh, to South End on Sea mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, in Essex. So I grew up there until I was 18 or 19. And then basically I've been kind of gone traveling the world ever since, you know. Mm-hmm. And then settled in, in L.A. We settled in L.A., and, yeah. And, and it, were you in England when you thought, I would like to be in acting, or was it here? I've been doing it since I was a kid. So okay. I joined a theater company. Uh, I was part of a dance um, studio when I was a kid uh, because my, when I was like seven or eight, my friend at school was like, I, I do tap and jazz dance. He goes, I'm the only dude in the class. <laughs> That's the reason he was in the class. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah, I was yeah. Like, oh, well, he didn't say dude. He said uh, bloke. But uh-huh. uh, and I thought, well, I'm coming. <laughs> and um, and then I joined a um, repertory theater company in mm-hmm. my teens, which was amazing experience because we would do musicals and pantos and old time music hall as well as mm-hmm. plays. Um, so the old time music hall was great variety uh, uh, experience. And nothing on the BBC. Uh, I didn't do any film or television in England, no. The only th- thing I did in England on TV was uh, Star Search, which they had, a, a f- there was a fledgling um, satellite company called Sky, Sky, which is now huge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was just, you know, in England, it's, uh, we don't like change. We're a very traditional country. So okay. you, anything that breaks tradition. Step takes, upper lip. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we had our four channels. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Don't need uh, any more. I don't need any, we don't need any more. <laughs> and then they, they came up with uh, Sky. Um, and so they did a star search. And the, the uh, it was not as big as American Idol, but kind Is of- Is that what developed later? Just as an aside, there's that huge thing then now where they have like singers from Norway and you know the Graham Norton uh, MCs. Um, you know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, uh, the Eurovision song. Yeah, Eurovision. Is oh, that- that, that's been around forever. No, oh. no. This is this is more like a, a, a very low rent um, AGT. Uh, America, AGT. Okay. Yeah, essentially. And and so I remember the judges. There was a, a singer called Susie Quattro. Mm-hmm. There was um, a guy called Roy Hudd, who was a comedy actor, and another comedy actor called Leslie Crowther. And the three of them were the judges. And so 
I went on and did a five minute magic spot and um, uh, I won my round. Mm -hmm. So I won that episode. But I remember the criticism was very, and I, and I, and I, I think I found it. I think I have it on video now is um, Susie Quattro was a rock star. She goes, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I enjoyed it. But I mean, like, is there, is there such a thing as a star magician? I mean, where do you go? What, what is there to do for magicians other than yeah. birthday parties? Like she didn't get it. She didn't yeah. get the business, you know? Yeah. I remember being so offended. Sure. Um, and then one of the other guys was like, well, no, there's variety in television, you know? So I get invited. So what, what am I at that point? I'm 18, 17, 18 years old. And um, I, they tell me, right, come back for the finals. So I, I work on this whole new four minute spot for the finals. And then I missed the train oh. <laughs> to London. <laughs> and you know, this is the world we live in now where I could just get on the phone or send an email. I had no way of communicating them yeah. with them. So I, I missed the train because I'm an idiot and I slept in. And I, and I get back, I finally get the next train. By the time I get to London, and by the time I slept across with my equipment, uh, they finished filming. Oh my, you know? you're out. And I, I was like, well, that's an idiotic thing to do. And I learned my lesson. So I'm always incredibly early. For anything. Everywhere you go. I'm the guy that shows up an hour. We're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, Magic at the Beach. Magic at the Beach is coming up very soon. It's going to be October 5th, 6th, and 7th in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And if you guys have not been to South Carolina or to Myrtle Beach in particular, this is your opportunity to make it a family affair because there's a lot going on in the beach or on the beach, magic on the beach. And uh, Charles Bach is here to tell us a little bit about it. Hey there, Charles. Hi there, Scott. So glad to have you here today. Now, as I said, this is going to be great for the family because I know the that there are, is not just one, not two, but three hosting hotels. So you can kind of pick wherever you want to stay uh, to attend the convention. So tell me a little bit about uh, where the hotels are and how close they are to the venue where you'll be performing. Absolutely. We've got two hotels that are right at Broadway at the beach. They're both within walking distance of the theater and all the uh, all the events and plus the attractions and the restaurants and all the things that are at Broadway at the beach. And the first one is La Quinta Inn and Suites. They're located at Broadway at the beach, about uh, 15 minutes walk right, right to the theater. And they have a special rate for us. It's a 79 on the first night and 99 on the next two nights. And they include free breakfast. They have Wi-Fi. They have a fitness center, all kinds of things available. And they're very close to the theater as well. And then we have the Holiday Inn Express, which also has a walking distance of the theater. But they're about 12 minutes, a little bit closer. And it's a little bit more expensive, a little fancier room. And it's 160 a night for the convention. They also have free breakfast and Wi-Fi, fitness center. And they're located very close. And if you want to be on the beach along the water and you want a balcony that overlooks the ocean, well, we have Dayton House Resort on the beach, which is about a 1.8 mile drive right to Broadway at the beach. And they have a hot breakfast. They have Wi-Fi. They have a balcony. And their rate is between 89 to 99 per night for the convention. Wow. That sounds like some uh, really good rates and uh, good places to stay. So really, you have your choice. That's interesting because a lot of times, well, all the time, every convention I've attended, there's always just been a hosting hotel and you've had no other choice other than just the uh, the place where the convention is going to be unless they fill up and then there's an overflow hotel nearby. But in this case, uh, you are anticipating having some opportunities for families to stay at these different locations. And it sounds like also that is uh, family oriented from the standpoint that I should say family friendly financially from the standpoint that you mentioned uh, free Wi-Fi and free breakfast as well. And I assume free parking. There's no parking, no resort fees, and there's no parking fees at Broadway at the beach either. So right by the theater, there's no parking fees. Wow. That sounds great. Well, it sounds like that not only should people be registering for the convention at magicatthebeach.org, but also I'm sure there's a link there that could take you to one of the hotels and you should make your reservation soon for one of these opportunities. Absolutely. You can click reserve and it'll take you right to our special rate. And again, the website is, Charles? It's magicatthebeach.org. There you go. Boys and girls, moms and dads, ladies and gentlemen, that's the place to go. Please go check it out and uh, and, and see who else is going to be performing there. There are, are so many things that you can learn there at that website that give you all the details that you need to make your vacation plans in Myrtle Beach come true for this fall. That's again, October 5th, 6th, and 7th. We hope to see you at the beach. I'll see you there, Charles. See you there. Thank you, Charles. 
I look forward to seeing you at Magic at the Beach. Yeah. I recall reading in that, uh, I referred earlier to the cover that you had on Magic Magazine, yeah. uh, of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that you had said something in there about uh, not wanting the people in the movie industry to know that you're a magician. Yeah. And was that part of the That's reason? That's part of, yes. Uh, that not fear then, that you had? Not then, but uh, in England, because I, I hadn't had that realization yet. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm talking about in L.A. when you came. Yeah, I, I wrote, that's, so I, I did a one man, my one-man show, Life oh, and Other right. Deceptions, and it was about that, de- yeah. making that decision. So when I came to L.A., um, I really thought I could do both magic and acting, and actually the magic was very, was integral to keeping me afloat while I was trying to break into the business. Mm-hmm. And then the more auditions I had, the more I worked at the Magic Castle, I kind of became this Beverly Hills party circuit guy, which was great. But then my clients as a magician were people like Lawrence Kasdan, were people, um, uh, what was his name? Davis. He was one of the richest men. In- anyway, so the, all of these industry people. But if I mentioned to them that I also was an actor, you would see their eyes glaze over it everyone's also an oh, actor. Everybody's and an actor. So yeah. then it, yeah. I would then go to auditions and I would have um, casting directors or writers or producers who knew me from magic. Mm-hmm. Either maybe I did, they, I was big on the bar mitzvah circuit. Mm-hmm. I did a million bar mitzvahs. And so I always felt they weren't taking me seriously. Uh, I had a situation where um, uh, Ray Stark, who was a big movie producer, Night of the Iguana, Funny Girl, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I met him at the Magic Castle and he said, to, and I always had in my introduction, you know, this guest star, he's an actor and blah, blah, blah. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, I'd love to talk to you about a movie. And I thought, absolutely. He said, come to dinner on Saturday. Like, wow. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. So I go. And he knows you're a magician. He He's seen me, but he wants to talk about a movie. movie right? yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is it. This is, you know, you're always looking for that, that break. break. Yeah. So I get to his house thinking it was just us. And there was maybe a dozen people there. And we had this big dinner, which was very Hollywood hanger on. His house was um, Rock Hudson's old house. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, when you show up, there's a police car in the front, which he bought. And he'd always park the police car in the front as a, as a deterrent to, to keep people the thieves. Yeah. Uh, but it was this amazing sprawling estate. And we had a lovely dinner and then everybody eventually, oh, then we had to sit and watch a movie. And the whole time I'm like, at some point, where's he going to bring it he up? He had a nice home theater, I'm sure. He has, yeah, he had a, you know, you know those guys had the full uh, projection. So they would send the reel over from the studio. He had a screening room It wasn't room digital. Almost. Yeah, the full screening room. So they, the studio had sent him um, uh, American Pie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, why I don't know. So then we sat and watched American Pie and the famous scene with the apple pie. Right. He didn't understand what was going on and nobody was going to explain it to him. <laughs> uh, so we watched American Pie and eventually everybody leaves. And, and it's just the two of you. Then. It's just like the, just us. And my ex-wife was with me as well, my first wife. And um, and we're talking and Ray loved magic. And uh, he says to me, uh, he hands me a script. He goes, take a look at this kid, you know. And it was Houdini, and he was planning to remake a Houdini movie. Mm-hmm. And I, he said I, he got Tom Cruise interested. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I th- and I thought it was great casting. Tom Cruise would be an amazing Houdini. He's mm-hmm. so right for it. The build, the charisma. Right. He actually, and he loves magic, right? Much better than Jack Reacher. I, just, I thought that was a poor <laughs> casting decision for him to be Jack Reacher. But uh, anyhow. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Well, he's got... He'd be good as Houdini. Houdini would be amazing. So... Uh, and especially then, this was probably 97, 98, maybe. Um, so I said, what part, what part do you want me to play? And, and Ray looked at me for a minute and he said, uh, no, 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 no. I, I want you to help me with the magic mm-hmm. for the movie. Okay. And, and my heart sank. Just to be uh, like a consultant. As, yeah, to okay. be a consultant. So I said, well, I'll, I said, I'll do that for free if you just, can I, like five point. lines, you yeah. know, like it's something. Just help me get yeah. my foot in the door, credit, you know. And he and he, he refused, and he said, "Look, you got to make a decision." You know, he said, "You, you got to choose what you're going to be. What are you? Are you a magician? Are you an actor?" You know, and it was, hmm. um, wow, a very kind. It was a moment. It was like a line in the sand, right? And I and I defining so I, moment, a in defining your life. moment in my life. And I went home and I thought about it, and I thought, well, the, I, there's so much conflict. I need to, I need to put the magic aside. Hmm. I need, I need to make that. Um, Sophie's choice decision yeah. of mm-hmm. which of my babies Child, to let go. Children, and yeah. mm-hmm. and um, it was very painful. And so I put the magic aside, sold my props. I was very angry about it. And then, and, I, and then if anyone asked me if I was a magician or they'd heard a rumor, I would say no. 
I would completely deny it. I was like, that's mm -hmm. another. Uh, uh, I started working as an actor, and I remember when, once once I got Crossing Jordan, um, the one of the heads of NBC came up to me and he said uh, one day, and he goes, uh, "You a couple of years ago, you did uh, magic at uh, uh, Avi uh, Avi Bernstein's uh, holiday party, right?" In, in Beverly Hills, and I was like, "No, that wasn't me." And he goes, <laughs> like yeah, Peter, he says, yeah, he says, yeah, he says, the Christ." No, I, I never I, learned, knew that I, man. No, yeah, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And he goes, "No, no, I remember." He says, "I remember you doing. You did this thing with the trick yeah. to describe this trick that I did." And, and he, then the cock crowed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I said, "No, it wasn't me." And, he, and the next day, he comes in with my business card. Oh my, Steve uh -huh. Valentine, sparkling hocus pocus, and I still denied it. I, I was like, "No, Steve Valentine." Yeah, <laughs> isn't, he's English too, and it was a pain in the ass. But you know, uh, <laughs> I just refused to to acknowledge it. And it was it was it was interesting because I missed it enormously, but I refused to to kind of go back to it until years later I was more established. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I felt like it was safe. Yeah, that you can come back because this way that you've already established yourself in the career you wanted to pursue. Uh, yeah. So really, in in your way, I mean, a lot of people are talking about part time magicians or part time pro. So you w decided to pursue your career first and then kind of have magic as the side and your career was acting. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, and again, this is all, I kind of discussed this in, in the one man show, but I had a situation in New Zealand, um, where I literally bumped into someone I knew from my childhood when I was filming a movie over there, who mm. was a magician and a member of a local magic club that when I was a kid, they let me join when it was an adults only club and yeah. it kind of changed everything for me. And I bump into this guy in New Zealand. He moved his family to New Zealand. Hmm. Um, and he had video from back in the seventies. Wow. Of all the old guys I remember, uh -huh. they were members of the club that was so nice to me. And it really um, made me stop and think. It was like, I always think the universe, well, I, I just feel the universe always guides you no matter whether you, it's guiding you where you think want to go or not but mm -hmm. it was kind of saying and there were all these things that had happened and it was just and it was just kind of telling me in a way that you know you you can't deny every side you shouldn't deny all parts of you or every side of you makes who you who you are you mm -hmm. know and i was inspired enough to to learn uh so there was video of my old mentor dick turpin who was a street performer doing the cards to pocket and he always tried to teach that to me but i was a teenager and i was you know girls right so right. I did, it's a it's a bit of a trick to learn when you're a it's teenager, hard, yeah. right? Because of the, the palming and everything. And um, and so I learned his routine. I video now of him doing it. And I thought, oh, I'll do this for you, you know? Yeah. And and then that inspired me to kind of investigate the trick. And that's why I ended up creating the, the C2P DVD collection, which is uh, like 120 videos on on all these different ways of doing it with sleight of hand, without sleight of hand, with gaffs, palming, came up with new palming techniques. And what I discovered was that even though I hadn't been doing magic for some a little bit, a little bit under ten years, the subconscious had always been working on it, mm -hmm. and so when I got back to doing kind of my old act, I had all these solutions all of a sudden for wow. things that had been problems in the past. So you never practiced it, but in your mind, it was still I, yeah. I feel like the subconscious huh. was always kind of growing and maturing and figuring these things out, uh, and then coming back to magic with a new perspective of having worked in TV and film for now for that amount of time, and also having a break from it so I could kind of have an, a more um, aware view of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, just it opened up these, these creative juices in me that, um, that uh, you know, have now poured into all of the products that I put out, all the DVDs, and then my new project, which is Magic on the Go. I was about is, to go yeah. there next. Oh, tell me something about Magic on Ma the Go. Yeah, so 2017, I decided to, um, I was really uh, disillusioned with the DVD business. Um, the, Why? What it costs to get them made. Mm. The um, you talk about the production studio and the, the quality, or the people the, around to the, film the and physical, the, audio. the physical cost of it. The uh, but also kind of like the the garbage side of it. You know, the 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 trash in the world and and the. Um, you're afraid you're going to get lost amongst all the rest of the DVDs that were out there. You mean because well, it was no? I mean more like you know the. Um, uh, Really, it, it was you, there was a lot of waste, like physical waste, right? You know that you create when you create the product. Okay. So um, the recycling and the and all this this other stuff that I don't know. It just for me there was and, and also there was a lot of uh, stages. Okay, so we, okay, we film it, we edit it, then we have to get it physically made, then we have to get the box made, then we have to ship it, then we have to have it shipped, 
And then you got to market it. And you got to market it. And then the you know online was really becoming popular. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, if I create kind of a uh, online database of all this, all of my stuff, then people can mm -hmm. uh, stream, it. stream it, access it mm -hmm. easier. And it, that whole thing grew um, because I Vimeo. There was a uh, Vimeo had a, a, a subsidiary called VHX that enabled me to do a subscription service. So I cut up all my videos into single into single videos, mm -hmm. and then put that on the site, and um, and then people are just able to or for a monthly subscription. Download a trick. They can they can stream anything, but the good thing is that they can stream it anywhere on their phone, on their iPad, no matter where. They, so if they forget a routine, or if they don't have anything going on, or if they you know, they can just put some headphones. They wouldn't have in. to have a DVD and have to search for that particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's and it's and everything's searchable yeah. um, within the with and so that ended up becoming. And I thought, well, maybe I'll add a couple of things every month you know, that I'm interested in. Sure. Because what's great about that with the single trick DVD thing is you've got to really make sure your product is worthy of, of, of making. It should be, you know, mm -hmm. worthy of making and selling. Um, but with uh, with the online site, if you have a membership, I can add something that is a tip or an idea or something I found in a magazine that I think should be not forgotten, mm -hmm. that should be remembered or could be um, improved upon. Um, you read a lot of magic books and old I do. magazines. I'm a and big reader okay. of, of magazines, especially in old magic books, because mm -hmm. those secrets, like Bascom Jones magic and that kind yeah, of yeah, like the Demon Telegraph or the oh, Magic my. Wand. I mean, I go wow, way go way back. back. <laughs> okay. Magic Wand is amazing. Some like 30, 40 years of of um, of history, you know, mm -hmm. built into the pages of those. You see, magic change. Uh, two world wars and a Russian revolution, and you just see magic change through the courses, uh, you know, where you that suddenly no uh, silk isn't available, eggs aren't available, steel isn't available, and so magic had to morph from being these giant illusion shows to being the smaller vaudeville shows, hmm. or old time musical, and you see how people their attitudes towards things change, um, and I love reading that because a lot of great magic is hidden in the pages of those old magazines, uh, and I I will find something that I think needs to be. Uh, memorialized, shall we say, and in, and I talk about this in my lecture as well, is that in the act of learning it and filming it, it's, it kind of hacks creativity in a way where my brain will go, well, I could always also do this. And then I'll end up having a few variations or improvements. So almost everything on Magic on the Go starts off as something that I, I feel needs to be remembered and then there will be two or three variations of my own to improve it. To, for an example, and I'll talk about this in my lecture. The um, there's a trick I found, I did a whole thing on egg bag, mm -hmm. uh, and because I wanted to really research the trick and learn it, because I there's can so never, many different types of egg bags for it's you know a yeah. slit or just a regular pocket regular, or, but, but, or plaid. Or, did yeah. you know there's an egg bag where you don't even have to put your hand in the bag where you just toss the egg in the bag and instantly turn it upside down and it doesn't fall out. I know. There's all of these variations over the course of history. Um, there are egg bag routines with ungimmicked egg bags um, and uh, gimmicked eggs. And so I started researching it and uh, like I did with C2P, with Cards to Pocket, mm -hmm. and discovered all these amazing uh, uh, historical things about egg bag. And I... I also stories surrounding it, char the characters surrounding it, like Albini, the guy that mm. basically uh, invented the routine as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, Arnold De Beer, Horace Golden, pieced together his routine. And uh, and then I, I started looking at egg bag routines that, that aren't egg bags, but kind of look like egg bags. So I came across a routine by George Blake that he put out in the 50s called No Egg, No Bag. And I had to track down the instructions for it. Well, when uh, David Devant did his uh, eggs, did he use an egg bag then also? Or he, He's got an egg bag routine in one of his books. It's larger bag, uh, isn't it? No, he, yeah. he had a normal egg bag routine, oh. but he, his, he was famous for eggs from hats, right. which was the, <clears throat> a, a great routine, um, which actually goes back to Thurston. And um, they swapped routines. Thurston and Devant would swap routines. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I think, I think Devant made more of it than Thurston did. Uh, Thurston was able to, because he wasn't miked in those days, uh, and he was on stage, he was able to stage cue the, the kid. kids mm -hmm. to do all kinds of funny stuff. Um, but uh, as far as the egg, yeah, there's, there's the large egg bag where you produce a number of eggs 
Um, and I tracked, I've got one of those from Thea from back in the day, which is well, lovely. I'm thinking perhaps then, what was the guy's name? Uh, Ricky Jay did some work uh, who had no hands nor feet. Uh, and um, Yes, his bag was, uh, I don't know who you mean, uh, I can't remember his name, but his he did that where he would produce a dozen or more eggs from and, and then and a the, chicken or something and a chicken and yeah. the impact of that trick was was so so much greater because of the time period uh -huh. because if you could afford a couple of eggs you're a wealthy person right so the fact that he was able to produce all of these things from a bag you know it mm -hmm. had a real kind of um, aspirational nature uh, to it mm. but then it was Albini who really took the trick and. Uh, uh, and turned it into kind of the challenge routine that we know it today, where, where you have the arms, the wrists held, check in the bag, it's not there, reach back in the bag. The volunteer. That was Albini, and he was a, a, a much hated character in magic back really? in his day. He, uh, he was very um, coarse and harsh and uh, reputedly um, didn't suffer fools well, you know, mm. didn't suffer magicians gladly, uh, to the point where when he passed in the Sphinx, the comment was, "The great Albini has died. May his fault let's let's let his faults rest with him." Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so something like that, okay. which is awful. You yeah. know, you don't want them. Uh, wow. uh, but what a character! But let these are, you know. Rest with him. So part of magic on the go is also the stories that surround the history, the shoulders upon which we stand. I'm surprised that you have not lectured for one of the collectors. Uh, Events that sounds fascinating. I haven't, and uh, I would love to. Uh, uh, the Dr. Egg Bill bag, Smith about that. The, the egg bag lecture would be something. <laughs> I think correct. I've got something like thirty or forty different egg bags from over the course of history, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, the the corner egg bag, which is really interesting, where they, the net corner egg bag that Fred Culpert invented, uh, which can be examined, but you see the egg uh, appear in the. You're talking the, about the one that we refer to as the Molini egg bag. No, it's um, it's imagine the Molini egg bag, but where the pocket is, the corners cut off, and then there's a net, a net pocket sewn oh, on. Oh, okay. So, so it's it's an so whenever the egg appears in the bag, you, you can see, see it. it. They see it visibly appear. Never seen that bag. Um, and so Culpit invented it, and it was put out by Max Andrews originally. I managed to, to track one down. But what was great was because where the netting is mm -hmm. sewed onto the bag, you uh, you have a natural seam, and that's where the pocket is. So it's super easy to find the pocket, but also if you put a little stitching, a thread through the pocket, you can close the pocket at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you can toss the bag out for examination. And uh, when the bag gets tossed back to you, pull that you just pull that thread out and now you have an open pocket. Ooh. Yeah, Which wow. is amazing. Amazing. Um, so no egg, no bag was interesting because right. I had to track down the instructions and which um, Bob Swaddling eventually helped me find because mm -hmm. he's got instructions because it was Harry Stanley who put it out. And and it was a really interesting routine. And at the end of it, the, 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 all the, you basically produce four eggs from the bag and then they vanish. And at the end, the bag falls to pieces and you have this great kind of no egg, no bag finale. Hmm. And then that's grown now to, I've applied a paper bag instead of the cloth bag mm -hmm. um, and uh, you produce at least a dozen eggs. And at the end, uh, they all transform into an orange. And it's, uh, and I'm, but we're talking right now at the convention in, in Houston and I'll be doing it in the show this week for the first time. Hmm. So nothing like doing a brand new routine in front of a room full of magicians, <laughs> but whatever. We're gonna, we're gonna live dangerously. How um, bad could it be? Yeah, and then I'll <laughs> what talk- What could go wrong? What could, everything. Uh, but then I'll talk about the, um, in the, uh, in the lecture, I will, uh, I'll also be talking about the growth of all the various stages of, of how in learning this trick and in teaching this trick, the original version, mm -hmm. um, I was just inspired. I would have, literally have ideas while I'm filming uh, it's just, it just, the act of teaching and giving somehow seems to hack the creative process for me. Mm -hmm. Um, it just opens up a, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting scenario. Because your mind goes there because and then you start thinking. That yeah. Way. Because you're also not forcing yourself to come up with anything. You're actually trying to show the only way to teach someone something is to understand it. Mm -hmm. So you're going from, I think you're going from a different part of your brain and in truly understanding it, the subconscious is just in the back going like, Hey, Hey, what about this? Mm-hmm. And you're not forcing yourself to come up with these ideas. Um, almost everything on Magic on the Go has been created in that way. In the act of teaching the original, um, a dozen or so variations have mm -hmm. come to mind and some really great improvements. I mean, now, um, because of that, I have almost, a, I have over 900 uh, videos on, Holy on Magic. Holy moly. And they're on all the accessible go. on that on the Everything's go. accessible. Uh, you know, you, you just stream it on your phone or your iPad. Um, and it's everything from, I have my own variations on podcasts. I do a thing called, um, uh, uh, 
uh, a past masters, which is kind of um, where I talk about an older magician, their, their, their career, their, what they were famous for, some of the gossip that surrounded them. And when you're talking about old, you mean like way old? Way back in the 20s, 30s, yeah. maybe before. Yeah, 100 years like ago. Like Paul Rossini and, and mm -hmm. all this, these kind of things that I think we should remember. Did he do Silks from Mouth? Is that Rossini? Uh, that was Carl Rossini, I think. Yeah. Paul did the, he was famous for basically egg bag, thumb tie, okay. um, the classics, but he just was a much loved magician in his day. Um, and uh, so I'll do those, those. And then I like to do things where I'll do the, I'll actually read an article. This is great about being an actor, right? So I'll do something where I'm going to read an article written by a magician. And I'll, the article, I'll, the article, the writing that I'll choose is as relevant today as it was when it was written back then. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the fun is to try and guess who, who wrote it or mm -hmm. who it's about uh, by the end of the, of the podcast. You know, um, One of the most fun uh, articles I found was in a uh, Conjurer's Weekly, um, and it's called The Worst Magic Show in the World. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a review of a magician called Steve Shepard, who in his day uh, had an amazing egg bag routine um, who's did a great vanishing cage where he immediately took his jacket off and could be have his sleeves examined, but he tried to put on a full evening show with zero rehearsal, like many magicians do. And it was yeah, a, how's that any different than today, right? Right, <laughs> and and it was an absolute disaster. And so uh, this I forget who's the wasn't it Hugh God who wrote the review of it? Maybe Lloyd Jones. Somebody wrote the review. And it's, it's the most scathing, yet absolutely accurate, brilliant review that you'll ever read of a bad magic show. Um, to the point where <laughs> at the end of the show, some old lady stands up and just goes, well, so long, suckers. <laughs> she leaves the and building walks out. and walks out. <laughs> um, so I read that review, you know, uh, articles by Oswald Williams. Anyway, it's, just, it's a really fun thing to do because uh, I think in the end, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And I think the more knowledge you have of magic, the sure. better magician you become. Exactly. Um, there's a, 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 a trend nowadays of uh, people learning six or seven tricks and just putting an act together, and that's all they know. Uh, but there's so much that can happen in the course of a performance that you need to be aware of what else is out there and what to do. And you can make that left turn and, if and, necessary. And too often, I believe, particularly younger people or people just getting into magic, it wouldn't be necessarily a young person, but they're thinking, ooh, this is kind of cool. And they think they've invented like the double lift or something without knowledge of where we have been and what's out there. Yeah. And I actually had to, uh, there was a guy who published a video of a move, young kid. And I'm like, that's in the magic wand in 1932. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy called Nelson Byford, Byford, Nelson Byford had this amazing cards, the pocket move where he moves his hand with the cards palmed to the right side of his hip and pushes the packet of cards against his hip, held with the little finger as he flashes his palm. Oh, clever. So his hands look empty right before he goes into the pocket. So very, it was a move that was way ahead of its time. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, small little paragraph, one of the issues. Uh, and I, but I you picked up on that. I, I, I call it the golden move, and I learned it. And I put it on on, on C two P and cast the pocket, and then and, and then I, I noticed some kids say I created this move where you know, and I'm sure he did. You yeah. know, I don't think he in his mind he didn't rip it off because mm -hmm. he, it wasn't Independently, reading. Was, yeah, but you know, you kind of want to be the guy that says yeah, that was already that's already been around, <laughs> and that's the problem with trying to do creative stuff is is. Uh, everyone's more than willing to tell you it's already been invented by somebody else. And you just have to go, well, okay. I was, uh, in, when I was in Houston, there was a, a, a young man who had contacted me from one of the suburbs. And they yeah. said, we're thinking about forming our own club up here because it's a little bit too far for us to drive to your club meetings. Um, and we'd like to uh, to have this and maybe have a few people from the club here if they can come up and kind of sure. you know, guide us. And as we continue our conversation uh, over a period of weeks, he finally decided, he said, after I've spoken to the rest of the, the young people who that basically were going to be all young people who were going to be forming this club, they said, well, we decided that we don't want a bunch of old people telling us that everything that we're coming up with has already been created. So they, so they decided consciously, consciously decided, okay, we don't want people telling us about history. So, uh, which is kind of where the world is heading. I guess you call that conscious ignorance, right? You, mm, that's where we term. That's yeah. where we're going right now. It's, it's, we want to change history or not talk about the things that happened in the past mm -hmm. because it, it makes us feel uncomfortable yeah, as opposed like tearing to tearing down statues and things. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's a very interesting world. We live this, this, um, yeah, conscious, conscious ignorance. 
Did you just come up with that? Or I is, did. I yeah. love that. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Copyright Steve Valentine 2023. <laughs> and speaking of Valentine, I, I know that is your stage name. We're not going to go into what your real name is, yep. but you had made that, long, that conscious decision a long time ago. I did. Uh, I was doing theater in England, and um, I wanted to join British Equity, the mm-hmm. Actors' Union. And it's a very catchy name. Gosh, it's great. Well, I was playing. It was an interesting thing. I, I, uh, sometimes I regret it, but it's... I was doing, there was a guy in the union who already had my name, mm-hmm. my actual name. And so, uh, you so know. So they said, you got to be somebody else. Yeah, 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 you can't have the same name. And I was doing a musical called Moulin Rouge. Uh, this would have been 80, I want to say 82, 81, 82. And I was doing a musical called Moulin Rouge and I was playing a, the role of Valentin, who is the, uh, in, in the Toulouse-Lautrec paintings of the Moulin Rouge, mm-hmm. there's always this very angular character with a top hat top and a hat. big hook nose. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it's always in silhouette. Um, yeah. And the reality is that uh, Valentin de la Sauce, I think that was how you pronounced it, but he was uh, the only guy in the, in the can, who would do the can-can with the girls. It was mm-hmm. double-jointed. Mm-hmm. Um, it was called The Boneless. But he was a good so looking. This guy really existed. Yeah, yeah, and he was a uh, was an interesting character because he was very good looking, and the women loved him. But he was gay. He mm-hmm. wasn't interested. And Toulouse Lautrec was not good looking, but loved women, and they didn't like him. And so he had a lot of jealousy oh. towards Valentin. And so he painted him in this way, uh, kind of kind of very ugly, kind of uh, hmm. uh, angular character, you know, which Valentin hated. So um, I decided to take that name. So I became uh, Stephen Valentin, and then everyone kept calling me Valentine. Mm-hmm. And so eventually it just became Valentine. Yeah. Interesting story. Didn't know how that... Uh, <laughs> That's how it all came about. <laughs> uh, yep. And working at the Magic Castle, you've uh, um, have you been nominated before? Have you, yeah, for... yeah. So it's been over the course of, of my time at the castle. Um, I won Close-Up Magician of the Year two times and then uh, lecturer of, of the... Lecturer, not lecture, lecture. I have been the uh, yeah, the lecturer of the year. Uh, <laughs> lecturer of the year. Um, a couple of times, and then Stage Magician of the Year. So I've been very honored to be um, recognized in that way. Um, right. Um, my favorite room there at the Magic Castle is the close-up room. It's just, I've had so many amazing evenings and experiences mm-hmm. in that room. Well, they're so close. They're right there on you. And they, and they, they used to be really... closer. You know, back in the day, uh, <laughs> when in the 90s, when uh, before the fire marshal uh, got involved, we could pack that close-up room with 60 people and uh, you could have standing a room only around the back. And then I would, it was a personal uh, challenge of mine to see how many people I could get in on any given show. And I, all the way down to the doors, and I didn't care about the angles, so all the way up around and down to the table. And we used to rock that room back in the 90s, the energy, the, 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 wow. because everyone was so tight and it, was, it would get hot and it would get sweaty. And I had people, people would pass out from the heat yeah. and we would stop the show and take them out to the bar, give them some water and then get back in and keep on going. Oh my and it, it was um, the experiences that, that from, I loved that room so much. Um, uh, I'm jealous of that because I first started back in 81, you know, yeah. and, and I remember when Vernon had come in and he sat in the front row and watched me and he came in three more times, you know, and he liked my act and he kept telling people to go in and watch and whatnot. But I don't remember them packing it like you were saying as far as, sure, they stand along the side, but I don't remember it being that. I do remember someone actually having a heart attack one time and they, you know, how the exit's right to yeah. the stage left over there and they, the ambulance pulled up and they took this guy out, you know, so that, that kind of shut things and down. And you know, and at the castle, I realized that when I was at, um, when I worked on the, I was on the board of directors for a couple of years, and and you know, you get all the reports, yeah. nightly reports, um, because there's a, and there's a lot of people choking on meat. Uh, Never thought about that. A, I guess that's true with any restaurant, serve, really. Yeah, when you serve steak, there's always someone who who hmm. uh, doesn't chew doesn't chew their meat properly. We had yeah. a situation once where right in front of me, uh, this guy, this woman goes down um, on the floor and. It was very interesting because everybody was afraid to act. Uh, you know, the, to give her a Heimlich? Nobody wanted, yeah, it, you know, because everyone's so afraid of being sued. Wow. That nobody wanted to act. And finally, a guy came in and he's like, he was a doctor. And he goes, I'm a doctor. And, let me, and he was about to do an emergency tracheotomy. He was about to, he said, get me a knife. I'm going to oh punch gosh. her right in front of everybody. And then he tried it one more time and got the, and got the meat out. Uh, with the Heimlich. Um, that happened to me at a gig. I, I was at, uh, doing a private gig once and um, I'd done the show and the client asked me if I wanted to stay for dinner and uh, I did and I just wanted to leave. I was tired. I wanted to leave. Mm. So I was rushing my dinner and I had a, got a piece of meat stuck in my throat. And um, I remember trying to communicate to my ex-wife at the time, 
you know, and she's like, what's the matter? And I'm like pointing yeah. to my throat, and pointing, hitting my stomach. And finally, this guy at one of the other tables sees that I'm choking, yeah. gets up, gives me the Heimlich. <laughs> such a scene in front of the audience. I just performed the show for them. Everyone was like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? And finally, the piece of meat comes out. Flying across the table. And I, it was, he saved my life, you know? And years later, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to say this was about six years ago. Mm -hmm. I was at the Magic Castle one night and this guy comes up to me and goes, you don't remember me, do you? No. And he's like, I'm, I saved you. He said, remember oh, you were choking? Gosh. And I was like, drinks for this guy yep. for the rest of the night. <laughs> Let me kiss your ring. Let me give Thank you, you. My, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, that, and those are the moments you, you never forget, you know? Yeah. I don't think I ever worked for those people again. <laughs> it's a bit dramatic. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic. I thank you very much for your time and all the stories. My, my oh, gosh, my I just, uh, it just uh, went by so quickly. I name my podcast is called The Magic Word, and I always like to conclude by asking, what is your life philosophy? Uh, my life philosophy, well, I believe, I think if I can do it, anyone can do it. And, but I, I think quiet confidence. I think if you go through life with quiet confidence in your abilities uh, and you don't let people put you off, mm -hmm. don't listen to the negatives, but also don't listen to the great superlatives. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, don't believe your own press. Don't believe your own press. Uh, the famous story of Paul Newman talking to Tom Cruise, right? When what was that? Uh, I don't remember that story. Oh, when they did Color of Money, um, which was, you know, The Color of Money yeah, was right. a sequel yeah. to uh, The Hustler. The Hustler, right. And Cruise was beginning to to make it. And uh, and Paul, it was famous for saying, to the, 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 don't believe your own press. Hmm. You know, you, you know, like, don't don't read the negative reviews, but then don't read the positive reviews. Don't, you know, don't let that go to your head. Just yeah. stay even keeled and work on your craft. And, and but... You know, it's funny you asked me this question now and having us had this discussion and there's a lot of, my life has changed since coming back into magic mm -hmm. and allowing that part of me to come alive again. Yeah. And I really believe in being all, that, that it's okay to be all of your facets as long as nobody gets hurt. Yeah. It's, it's okay. All these different facets of your personality uh, are, um, are legitimate and are, and are worth exploring and in the past, it, people would have to choose one career. Mm -hmm. I met, after I did the show, um, uh, uh, the one-man show, uh, people would come up to me and say, I had the same thing happen to me where I had to choose between this and this. Uh, one guy wanted to be a concert pianist and his parents insisted that he be a doctor. And so he lost that opportunity. Um, but it is okay to be all, everything that you want to be. Do it all because we have one life and, and you'll be happy you did. That sounds also like a diversity that people are today deciding I am gay or whatever and how, whatever whatever they are. Be who you are. You be who you are and not be afraid of that um, and to live your life the way that you can live it yeah. without fear. Uh, I mean, there is fear obviously out there still, but yeah, not as much as what, unfortunately. And so what I hear you saying, yes, that uh, just be living confident life. It sounds so... Simple. Have silent confidence, it, I think you'd said, or something. Quiet confidence. Quiet confidence, quiet confidence, yeah. confidence yeah. in who you are and what you and, and be who you are. And it sounds so simple, and it isn't, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But um, it took me years to to come back and imagine and kind of be comfortable magic, with that be, because yeah, and, you need to prove yourself first of all in your chosen career yeah. without having that other one influence people say well didn't aren't you a magician and we don't want a magician you know because yeah. he'll be he, he thinks he knows how to act and he won't take direction or whatever so i i, I can see and why also, you i think now the two. and i do think now we are in a world where it's almost expected of us to have a million side hustles it's almost expected mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. have a, a bunch of different passions and and it's yeah. acceptable Multiple streams of revenue. Multiple streams of revenue. And, uh, you know, it's like being an actor is not enough anymore. Mm -hmm. Being anything is not enough. So it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay to do all of these things now. I think it's, it's expected. Yeah. It's just the way life is. Yeah. Steve, thanks very much. My pleasure. <laughs> I love hanging Let's do out this again you. in a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> and see where we are then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Look forward to it. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Steve Valentine. This is Scotty out. Wow, that was great. Thank you very much, Steve, for being my guest this week on the Magic Word Podcast. I'm glad we finally got a chance to sit down and chat, and I just might take you up on uh, coming back again uh, in another year or so, somewhere down the road, and kind of seeing how our lives have changed at that point. 
Well, I also want to thank the sponsor for this week. That is Magic at the Beach, again, coming up October 5th, 6th, and 7th in Myrtle Beach, California. Be sure to go and check that out on their website at magicatthebeach.org. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to have quiet confidence. This is Scotty out. <laughs>